I'm here with uh, TJ Kirk, the amazing atheist. Do you still go by that, or is that just uh, the yep. moniker that still do? I noticed you had uh, changed your channel name a while back, so yeah, I sure. tried. I kind of tried that. And, uh, I decided to just change it back because I was like, well, that's how people know me. So fair. Uh, yeah, and you see you're working on a novel. What's your novel about? Fiction, nonfiction? Yeah, I mean, it's uh, it's uh, about it's called Sex Bot Uprising. <laughs> it's a it's a space pseudo intellectual space smut. Hell yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's right up my alley, really. So yeah, mine too. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Literally and figuratively. Oh, man, yeah. <laughs> what uh, do you have a like a target release date for that? Oh, I mean, yeah, like a few months back. <laughs> uh, no, um, I don't know. Probably, I'm hoping first quarter next year. Cool. Yeah, it's hard to keep fucking anything on track, at least for me. I know, uh, yeah. I like, my. it was like my goal. I started the book in 2020, and then I was writing on it, and I got to the point where I realized, like, well, this is uh, not working because the story I'm trying to tell is way too expansive for one book, and I just was not i didn't have enough experience to realize that so i um basically just decided to try to write the story the overarching story is more like a series of like self-contained stories that kind of have a larger story unfold over time you know nice a little bit more serialized and um so i the uh the l ron hubbard approach yeah i guess <laughs> I'm just... or just like i treat it like a season of television like every book i'm gonna think of is like a season of a tv show or something and uh that's a good idea because i watch more tv than i read books even though i'm trying to write a book Same. like i'm writing a book because i want to make a tv show but i don't have the money to make a tv show so i'm just like you know i'm gonna do what i can to make that creative endeavor happen hell yeah um you know so uh Hopefully people will like it or at least buy it. And I mean, hopefully if, even if they hate it, it's entertaining. So that's my goal is like, I figure if I put enough crazy shit in there, even if it's not technically good, it'll still be fun. Yeah. Cause that's kind of like the approach I like from like filmmakers and stuff, you know, like I would love, I love to watch a terrible B movie that just has a lot of like crazy, you know, shit in there. Uh, Cause then even if the movie like technically sucks and the acting is horrible and whatever there's, well, you know, there's still the crazy part where the woman shoots chainsaws out of her tits or whatever the fuck happens. Yeah. Right, so. <laughs> uh, my friend and I were just talking about the recent mortal Kombat uh, movie that they did compared to the nineties one. It's like the nineties one isn't a good movie, but it's way more fucking fun than the shit. Yeah. They just did. I, uh, I have to agree with you there. I felt like the, the new Mortal Kombat, it delivered on the blood, but it pretty much like sucked out, like Shang Tsung, it sucked out the soul, you know? Like there yeah. was some, there was a sense of like fun to the first film. There was a sense of like character. Um, yep. And in the new one, it's just like, everyone's just a blank slate, except for maybe Kato, but, or Kano. Yeah, it's Kano. yeah he was, that, he was uh, the most but, interesting part for sure. But, uh, just, you know, his only one was a fucking character. Everyone else was just like, you know, blank, blank slate hero and blank slate villain. Taking it way too seriously. That was the issue. Uh, but I mean, the games do that too. So I don't know. Like, it seems like the first, the early games had more of a sense of humor than the new shit too. So I don't know. Yeah. They were like, we, we know this is cheesy, but we're leaning into it. So yeah, I, I agree with you. That's uh, the better way to go. Like if you can't pull off the, the more serious uh, dramatic stuff and you can't write, you know, decent characterization than just you know, make it camp. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm trying to make it actually good, but I'm also building in the camp factor so that even if it's not good, I mean, like really a lot of it's just like me pretentiously trying to like espouse my philosophy through fiction um, and say like some of the things that I feel like it's difficult to say on YouTube because yeah. of like restrictions and shit. Um, it's easier to fucking cloak something in a bunch of allegory and stuff. And I have like, True all kinds of that going on, but whatever people will see when they see. Well, and that, that brings up an interesting point that, uh, you've been doing YouTube for what, 12, 15 years or 15 something? years, I think. Yeah. And I imagine that the, the, the rules and regulations have changed pretty dramatically. Oh, all the time. It's like every fucking goddamn, every few months, weeks, years, some new T TOS, some new standard, some new idea about what, is expected of a content creator on the platform and it's always changing 
and it's always inconsistently applied and it's always confusing as to what's allowed and what's not. And there's always a shit ton of gray area. And uh, just when you think you're used to it and you figured it out, they change it again. Uh, they really keep you on your toes, YouTube, that's for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it seems like, and when there's gray area and it, like you said, it's applied unevenly, it seems like it's usually like the shittiest aspects of, of content that get to take advantage of that stuff. Whereas, you know, other people are just trying to make some, some decent content and, and well, speak their mind. Get And I see this all across social media. I don't mean to interrupt, but um, no, go ahead. this is a thing I was thinking about the other day when I was looking at a, a Matt Walsh tweet and he was saying like, you know, um, you know, I'm glad, I'm glad we genocided them indigenous, you know, peoples and, you know, that's great. And genocide's good and blah, blah, blah. And I'm just like, this dude can literally go on Twitter and just be like, yeah, genocide. Cool. But if I was to say like Matt Walsh, I want to, I want to see someone bash you in the face with a fucking rock until you're left a bloody mess on the ground. If, if someone were to say something like that on Twitter, yeah. they'd be instantly banned. Yep. And uh, you know, <laughs> it was very hard for me not to get banned in that moment, but um, you know, it's just weird to me. Like, and then I saw there was another guy, I think it was Bill Crystal, one of these fucking neocon shit bags that was uh, saying that, uh, you know, we, we ought to, we ought to kill, we ought to bomb, destroy an entire village for every American troop that got killed in Afghanistan in the exit or whatever, every troop that died, we need to destroy an entire Afghan village. And I'm just like, this dude can just advocate for this nakedly and openly right there in the fucking public sphere. But if I was to say this guy should get like his fucking, you know, jaw wired shut or something if i even implied any violence towards him whatsoever it would be instantly censored so he can fucking advocate for the destruction of fucking thousands of innocent lives openly and freely but if i fucking say that his piece of shit ass should get his comeuppance you know i'm the bad guy in the eyes of a fucking program like twitter and then these same conservatives are the ones that bitch about being censored when they're really allowed to go on there and advocate for fucking genocide and anybody who fucking speaks out against them has to watch their fucking mouth Yep. I mean, it's just a ridiculous standard. This fucking social media shit is like so stacked against like left thought. It's fucking ridiculous. And um, and all these conservatives that fucking go around crying that they're the victims are just like a, a parody to me, a satire of reality. Uh, absolutely pathetic pig shit motherfuckers. Each and every last stinking motherfucking one of them, uh, et cetera. So, Full agree, yeah. man. Full agree. Uh, like I, it's It's hilarious to me how, you know, also kind of tragic and fucked up, but you know, they're on Twitter with hundreds of thousands of followers saying I'm being censored, right? Right. <laughs> like, uh, or, or uh, you know, the cancel thing is, is another one. And Dave Chappelle just kind of proved that uh, pretty clearly, right. you know, right? Like he's being canceled and yet he's not. Like, it's just such a arbitrary fucking thing. I mean, I would, I would, I could point to a few people who I think were canceled, I guess. Sure. Um, I would say uh, um, Roseanne Barr was definitely canceled because she was literally canceled. <laughs> like right. she was literally, I mean, I guess the, the, the Roseanne show was canceled and a new show called the Connors took its place and she was written out of the show and she's gone now. Um, so that's like an example, I guess, of a cancellation or I guess Gina Carano from star Wars was also canceled. And I don't really think those cancellations were a good idea uh, to be honest with you. I feel like when I talk to people out there in the public sphere in public spaces, um, about those issues. I feel like I almost never hear anyone agree with that kind of stuff. I only see that sort of agreement on Twitter. Now, maybe it's just that the people who, you know, support those cancellations are just like reluctant to say things in public because it feels like they're so overwhelmed by others or something. I don't know. But um, I do remember shortly after Roseanne's cancellation, I was at my uncle's house in Blackjack, Missis uh, not Blackjack, Mississippi, Blackjack, Missouri, which is I think like a 95% black town. And he was having a party at his house and almost every guest there was black. And the issue of Roseanne came up because it was a hot topic in the news at the time. And, you know, even in this town of, you know, black people, um, no one was, uh, no one was fucking supporting the cancellation. They all thought it was ridiculous. Now that's just obviously anecdotal shit, but like, I don't know. It just seems like over and over again, I've never found a person in the wild that was like Roseanne cancellation is good, whether they're left, right, or whatever. It just, I don't think it's good optically, the sure. cancellation, because I think people don't recognize the nuance of it. And I think that if we looked at moments like what Roseanne said as an opportunity to have a conversation, 
or what Chappelle said as an opportunity to have a conversation, but it becomes so much about the personality because human beings are so focused on the personality, this person and their flaws and their foibles, and we have to punish them for saying wrong thing. But it's like, look, I get that they did wrong thing, but maybe the more productive approach is let's have like a national discourse. But every time there's a like the things we consider discourse now are just so uh, drama laden and yeah, you know, hyperbolic this, and shit. It's just yeah, right. Very- it just becomes about like we killed the ba- like. It's like they think that you can put all of like the if if Roseanne says something that's racist, it's like you think you can put all racism onto her and then destroy her in effigy and then racism is defeated. But that's not how it works. Like you know the 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 shit she said didn't fucking emerge from the ether. It didn't promulgate from the depths of her dark soul this is shit that's free floating around there in the zeitgeist yep and you know until you actually look at the root cause and handle that um you know you're not doing anything by just fucking dealing with symptoms like roseanne is a symptom dave Chappelle's transphobic comments i didn't see them so i don't really know to what extent they were transphobic but um you know, they're, they're, those comments, they, they, they didn't emerge from the ether. They, can't, they didn't come from Dave Chappelle's fucking soul necessarily. There's shit floating around. We're all fucking, you know, engines of memes and things that are just right. floating around there in the culture. Um, so, you know, you got to fucking have a cultural discussion. You really want to change hearts and minds. You have to fucking get to the core issues that are really affecting people. Anyway, I, I've been yammering long enough. You go ahead. No, that, I mean, that's good, man. I fully agree. It's just uh, like... It becomes difficult with uh, when a good half of, you know, probably more if I'm being, uh, you know, fair, there's a lot of people on the left that don't want to have an honest conversation as well. But like the right seems in, in a lot of cases almost incapable of it, you know, of even operating on, on a similar, uh, <laughs> you know, wavelength. Oh, yeah. I mean, I don't know. You, you talk to these people and a lot of times it just feels like there's. I don't want to use the overused term of bad faith, but I mean, yeah. just their, their, their approaches to the topics are just typified by it because it's just so clear that they start at the conclusion and work back. Um, and yep. that's always a recipe for fucking stupidity. It just is. I mean, there's, if you started the conclusion, that's just the most emotionally satisfying to you and then work back from there, you're going to fucking believe and say some heinous shit because you're, you're just, you're living in an echo chamber. Um, you know, and it's like, there's no, uh, there's no capacity to disagree with it. There's no capacity to like formally challenge it. There is just certain things that are just taken of articles of faith, like the inherent goodness of police, no matter what, right. or the inherent goodness of, uh, you know, the, of the American military, no matter what, or, you know, the inherent goodness of your, the latest Republican president, no matter what, um, you know, and I feel right. like the people on the left are way more able to criticize Biden then people on the right were able to criticize Trump. And it's always oh, yeah. been that way. I mean, it just seems like Democratic Democrats, uh, whether you know anybody who votes a Democrat or even is like Democrat adjacent in any way is usually more capable of criticizing uh, their candidates than the right wingers are. Even if there's someone like terrible, like Trump or Bush, and they're always someone terrible because that's what they like. They like terrible. Right. Um, you know, they just defend anything, even if it's like, even if, even if that person does something they don't like, they'll still defend, them, you know? So it's like, um, they start with the conclusion, Trump is the greatest. And then they work their way back from there. They start with a conclusion, police are great, work their way back from there. It's, it's always that. That's, so that's how you get to these. very difficult to have a dialogue with that kind of people. Very much. Yeah. I mean, you get to these, like the last four or five years with, of Trump, we saw like how far they're willing to bend over backwards and just distort reality to fucking, like you said, back up anything he says or does because they're starting at the conclusion that it's it's good um yeah uh so well that brings me to an interesting uh question well what i'm curious about personally uh Mm -hmm. is like was there anything in particular that signified your uh i guess you know i don't know if you were really on the right before i don't think you were but i mean like you were much more uh aggressive against sjw's so to speak and and uh now i see you know that you speak out in well, for the, things that might be considered. The way, I, the way I explain this to people is, um, and I don't know, there's probably so many nuance and facets to it that there's no way I could fucking possibly explain it uh, all. But uh, the way I would explain it is this. Um, when I started off on YouTube, I was a libertarian. I consider myself right wing at that time, but I was like libertarian right. I had read a lot of Ayn Rand as a teenager, and that was kind of where my head space was. 
Um, I'd read some, some Nietzsche poorly. <laughs> um, you know, I'd read some Anton Zandor LaVey from the church of Satan. So I had a lot of these like very like rugged individualisty type of, you know, thinkers buzzing around in my, in my head. And, uh, you know, so I had this really romanticized notion of, of that. And then, um, you know, I got off into the real world and I realized all those teachings were pretty much bullshit. Um, that, you know, no man is an island. The society is built of like codependent, you know, little pieces. And it's not, you know, the rugged individualist that, you know, drives things. It's the fucking communal efforts of humanity. Um, and then, you know, Obama got elected and I believed in Obama. I was, you know, like, wow, this is, this guy is really like coming to change things. Uh, that turned out to be, you know, yeah. massively, horribly disappointing. He, he snowed and, a uh, lot of us. <laughs> right. And so that was a, a hugely disenfranchising experience for a lot of people, I think around my age range, uh, especially people who became more left leaning over time. Um, and, you know, I, I considered myself during that time to be liberal. I didn't consider myself to be a leftist, but I didn't even really know what a leftist was. I didn't know the distinction between a liberal and a leftist. I just was I was into politics, but I was into party politics. And to me, it was like there's Democrats and there's Republicans, and that's what it is. Uh, I was saying things that were leftism or like proto leftism. I was thinking things that were leftism or proto leftism, but I wasn't engaging with that space. So I had no fucking real notion that that was sort of where my, my headspace was going. Um, and, you know, when the red wave happened around, you know, 2015, 2016, some of those fucking ideas did penetrate my consciousness. Um, and there were some talking points that kind of, you know, germinated within me because there was people in my community, uh, the anti SJW sort of YouTubers and stuff or the skeptic community or whatever you want to call it that, um, you know, that, they, that those that seem to be fertile ground for a lot of those ideas. And, uh, you know, because I was being inundated with it. And because all of my peers were kind of into it, I was like, whoa, yeah, this is, uh, this is the way things, you know, this is a good talking point. This is the way things should be. Um, but I didn't realize that basically something that I got into, I really kind of started the anti SJW thing on YouTube. I know that's like a weird vein. No, I, I, I fully agree. To as say, far but, as... but I mean, like, if you go back and look like my video, um, it's only sexist when men do it is kind of like the, the precursor to all the and the, the like the anti SJW stuff that happened on YouTube since then. Yep. Um, and if you look at that video, it's about hypocrisy and it's about double standards, and it's not about um, well. The, the incident that it was I was upset about was there was a, an episode of the knockoff The View. I can't remember what it's called with Sharon Osbourne. It's like the talk or something. Yeah. And they were all laughing about a man who had his penis like chopped off and thrown into a, a garbage disposal. And I was like, well, you know, if, if you want to find that funny, if you want to have a dark sense of humor, that's fine. But if it's funny that that happened to that guy, it should be equally funny if a dude chops off his wife's tits and throws them in a garbage disposal. You know, if you're going to laugh at that, you should laugh at that. Um, both should be equally acceptable or neither should be acceptable. That's all I ask. Consistency. Um, you know, and I get that there's power differentials and stuff like that. But, you know, at the end of the day, we're talking about something is mutilation. I don't think power differential should fucking factor too much. No. Into it. It's wrong to mutilate people and destroy parts of their body. Um, that should be flatly wrong, regardless of any sort of power differential, unless we're talking about something like a wartime event or something. But um, anyway, so I was upset about that. And I uh, ranted and raved against it and it was a huge hit and it was like front page of Reddit and it was, uh, you know, a lot of attention and views. And of course, I got more and more into it. And uh, the anti sjw stuff for me, the central focus of the content that I made, and you can go back and look for the most part. Now, there's I'm not saying I never said anything that was like right wing by today's standards or maybe even by the standards of the time. But for the most part, what mine was about was... Um, people who I felt were trying to control art and entertainment and media. And my fucking cry to them was always, Hey, go make your own fucking shit. Go make your own fucking art that reflects your sensibilities. Then you don't like what fucking is on offer. Go do something yourself instead of just bitching about it. And they have now there's tons of stuff that's made with the sensibilities of the people I used to criticize. And you know what? A lot of it's actually pretty good. Like I've watched some of it that some of this like woke content or whatever. And a lot of it's actually really good, well-written, interesting characters, new perspective. Exactly. And yeah. all of the people who 
you know, used to say with me, oh yeah, just do your own shit. Just do your own shit. Now all of a sudden they're like, this is, they're taking over our shit. Look at this. They make, they're making their own shit and it's horrible. We hate it. Ah, we're scared. It's like, this is what you, this is what you said you wanted. Now I, I happen to believe that if, um, a horny ass thirsty dude wants to read a comic about, you know, a big titted vampire slayer with massive breasts uh, that, you know, fights demons or whatever the fuck. And she's barely dressed and it's like totally sexualized and cheesy. I think that should be totally fine and permissible and acceptable and awesome and great. And, uh, you know, I'd never say, I would never say a word against it. Uh, but if someone, if, you know, if there's something that wants to take things more seriously, sexualized, you know, you want to read a thing of a sexualized men, go ahead. You want to read a thing with sexualized women, go ahead. You want to read a thing that has no fucking element of sexuality, go ahead. Violence, yeah, if, if you, violence is an element that works in a story, do it. If it doesn't, don't do it. You know, like these are all to me story elements. And what I didn't like is, what I don't like to this day is when people try to take creative freedom away from people and say, no, you're not allowed to use this element because I don't like it. And uh, to me, the SJWs used to be the ones that were like, no, don't use this element. No, don't use this element. I'm like, I don't like that. People should be able to freely express themselves. And now I feel like the problem is way more severe with the anti-SJWs. Don't use this element. Don't make that a woman. Don't make that a black guy. That's too woke. That's political. Oh, no, that's, that's oh, the gay Superman. No, no, I don't want that. Bye, Superman. Sorry. Um, you know, and it's like, they're the ones now that are trying to like stop creatives from using elements that they don't like. So it just seems like, I feel like I've been consistently on the side of the fight that says, don't restrict artists. Don't take away creative freedom from people who are trying to like bring something new into the world. They need the freedom to be able to express themselves. And, um, that's been consistently what I've believed. And, you know, I'll fight anybody who's fucking against it. SJW, anti SJW, I don't care. Um, artists should be free. That's, that's a central tenet of my fucking beliefs on that. Yeah. Hell yeah. <laughs> I mean, uh, yeah, I don't know if you've even seen any of my content or not. I deal with a lot of comic book stuff and, uh, you know, comic skate I mean, types. I figured. <laughs> uh, yeah. And, and I know you from your Twitter more than I know you from your, your YouTube. Oh, I'm sorry about that. Uh, <laughs> well, you know, <laughs> but yeah, it's, uh, there's a whole lot of, well, I mean, with, with comic skating in particular to me, all I see is, you know, like I don't take any of their, their complaints really seriously, like, because they're the, the, the talking points are designed at the top from the guys that are trying to sell their indie comics. And they do that by talking shit on mainstream comics. Right. So then right. those talking points just, filter down to the followers and they, they think they're saying something valid. And, but yeah, so my, my whole point since the start of the channel has been like, I mean, at least they're, at least they're doing their own creative endeavors. And I yeah. mean, like the thing is like, you can criticize the stuff they're doing and be like, you know, your comics suck and they're a bunch of fucking right wing proto fascists or crypto fascist garbage um, or whatever the fuck. I don't know what their, what the, what the content of their comics is. I assume it's like, you know, probably a lot of like uh I don't know, jingoism or something. I, I've never seen one of these comics. I don't know. Um, I don't really know much about the comics gate thing, to be honest, but um, I guess uh, I guess it's like sort of like Gamergate or in, on yeah, these other gates. It's know. an extension of that. Sure, there's a lot of overlap, crossover. I mean, it's essentially just the comic book uh, uh, fandom version of everything else that's going on every, you know, in every other part of the culture, right? So it's the same essential talking points just boiled down into uh, specifics to comics. And, and yeah, I, like you said, I don't give a shit what kind of comics they want to make and sell and stuff. My, my focus is harm reduction and, uh, and there is direct harm, like lots of evidence of, you know, harassment campaigns and bullying. There's a lot of these people are involved on Kiwi farms, you know, and they're like trying to get, you know, uh, queer and people of color comics creators and fans to doxing them, harassing them, uh, legit trying to get them to kill themselves. Uh, shit like that, that, that I take issue with, like, do whatever the fuck you want to do over here in your corner and stuff. But like, why do you have to make enemies out of people that don't want that? You know what I mean? I mean, I guess it's like a sales tactic, maybe yeah. just like, Hey, you know, uh, much, I'm yeah. like, I'm doing this rogue comic and, uh, you know, the mainstream is full of these lies or whatever the fuck they, the rhetoric is. I don't know. Uh, I mean, I don't, I don't want to speak too much on a topic that I'm not like familiar with. So I don't really know what their motives or objectives are, but, um, you know, I mean, I would say for them, if they're, if they're trying to sell their own indie comics, at least they're fucking enterprising enough to like be doing creative stuff on their own. But, you know, um, I would say, let your, let it stand on its own. You know, no, you don't need to fucking, uh, like, I don't know. Like, I, I feel like if the, uh, the, 
the Rolling Stones and the Beatles or whatever, <laughs> they put out albums, you know, it's like the album, the album stand for themselves. They don't necessarily need to fucking talk endless amounts of shit. Although I guess those guys <laughs> did talk a little shit, but, um, you know, I'm just saying like, uh, you know, you put your fucking like shit there out on the marketplace. Like, here's our vision. Here's what we think is like a good comic book. I think probably what they resent is maybe being like pushed out of the mainstream, like that their ideas can't, uh, you know, can't make it at the DC or a Marvel or something like that anymore uh, because those companies are like too woke or whatever. But like people need to realize that every single era and every single time and every single place have like standards and practices and they're always going to be, you know, it's like the YouTube thing. It's like sometimes you got to fucking flirt with that edge. Sometimes you got to like, you know, make shit that, you know, is interpreted one way on a superficial level, but is interpreted another way on a deeper, you know, metaphorical level. Um, but I don't really know, like, what what kind of stuff are they trying to do in their comics that are, you know, like, not, I guess, they feel like is prohibited at, a, at like, the DC or Marvel well, level. Their, their, their rallying cry is often, we, we, don't, we just don't want forced diversity or, or forced messages, political stuff in our comics. They, because they, they're under the impression, a lot of them, that comics haven't had those things up until the last few years. Which right. is just bullshit. It's, it's I mean, it's it's a it's a typical conservative thing to like ascribe, you know, <laughs> things that have been around forever that are like they find like distasteful to like modernity. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, like you know, the X Men, like super blatant, like gay a uh, allegory in the X Men from the fucking like baked into the very premise of it. You know, <laughs> civil rights um, and it, pretty much anything that you want to apply there, it works. Yeah, right. You know, um, like any fucking sort of out group that's being like persecuted by the mainstream sort of thing. And of course, they try to rewrite that history, though. There's like a couple of guys at the top of Comics Gate, especially who, you know, and they're very often former pros. They used to work for Marvel and DC, you know, and like we're talented. Yeah, I see you always talking uh, uh, shit on Ethan Van Skyver, yeah. Skiver, Shiver. I don't know how to pronounce it. Yeah, he, he used to be a Green Lantern artist and stuff. I used to fucking like him. You know, he's he used to. No, he's be a very. Really he's artist. actually a very talented artist. Uh, yeah. Or at least he was. I don't but know. But he he shit. But he spent like I watched him devolve on like Facebook first and then on Twitter over from like 2010 up until a few years ago. He was just like constantly, you know, he would say homophobic, transphobic, bigoted shit, and then you know people would get mad and he'd apologize. Oh, I'm not going to do that again. And it just happened so many times over and over that DC eventually was like, well, we don't want you working for us anymore because you right. know you're representing a fucking brand, and if that's the kind of you know they gave him like four five six seven chances and uh he keeps doing it but then he they let him go and somehow he feels entitled to still be you know the the same level of of creator that he was and it's like i mean yeah go off and do your own thing sure but th this resentment towards the industry is if it did something to you and you're not you know responsible accountable yeah, I mean, for like, your actions i don't know it's like on youtube like i'm aware of like the standards and practices of YouTube. And like I said, it's not always fair here. It's like, you know, you, you, you feel like, well, can I get away with this or not? Can I do this or not? And it's not always clear. And I kind of sympathize to a degree where it's like, you don't necessarily know where the line always is. And you don't necessarily know what's acceptable. And like, you know, to some degree, I kind of sympathize with the plight of people who are in his position in the sense that these corporations do not actually care about trans people or gay people or any of these people. Um, it's, it's all about money for them. I truly believe that when you have a corporate entity that gets, I, I think maybe a small business, there can be some actual ethos to it. There can be some kind of principle or ethics, but like the larger a company gets, the more that sort of thing kind of fizzles away. It's like how Google used to have the like, do no evil kind of slogan yeah. that, you know, they got progressively more and more evil and they finally just dropped the fucking slogan. They're like, <laughs> eh. We're evil, you know, yeah. and um, I think that, you know, the, the same could be true of like a DC and Marvel. I feel like if public sentiment changed tomorrow or over the next like 10 years, uh, you know, and, you know, it was way popular to hate gay and trans and lesbian, whatever the fuck people, um, you know, you, you'd see totally different behavior from these these corporate BMS. They they go along with fucking like just like a politician, like, oh, which way is the wind blowing? Um so I guess there's, you know, so when, when people like an Ethan Van Skyver or whatever, yeah, fucking identify hypocrisy, I guess, in something like that, I think I can kind of empathize with him on that front. But like, I don't know, I feel like there should be a deeper question in your mind of like, 
why do I feel like trans people are my enemy? Why do I feel like gay people are my enemy? Why am I so upset when I see, you know, a, a, a man kissing another man in a comic book? Like, why does that, why does that get my goat so much? Why am I so susceptible to being emotionally triggered by this event happening? Um, you know, maybe question that a little bit, like do some like introspection on that issue. Cause uh, you know, I mean, there's a lot of problems in the world and I feel like very, very few of them are caused by the existence of LGBTQ plus people. Um, almost yep. none really. <laughs> yeah. Almost none. I mean, it's, it's uh, a, <laughs> yeah. I mean the, the hip hop, you're right about the hypocrisy of corporations, not actually giving a shit. What I, what I would say to that is the hypocrisy of people who identify as conservatives who are supposed to be the, you know, free market capitalists, right? And they're like begrudging a company for doing what what's best for its bottom line and making profit. You know what I mean? Right. I mean, well, that, I think that's why you're seeing a lot more and more conservatives turn their backs on capitalism. You've seen, I see less and less of the free market capitalist talk um, from the conservative sector, because I think they're starting to see like, whoa, this does not always actually serve our interests. Like sometimes this goes the other way. Um, especially on social issues. Um, so, you know, I mean, like, I, I feel like they're, uh, they're becoming a little disenfranchised and jaded with capitalism, which is probably why they're more susceptible now to like fascist ideology. The bad news though, is that capitalism is actually very, uh, capitalism is more friendly towards fascism than it is towards uh, any sort of leftism. Yeah. Uh, because ultimately at the end of the day, leftism wants to dismantle capitalism and, you know, totalitarianism and capitalism can exist hand in hand. I mean, we see that with China, which is was ostensibly started off as communist, but is now state run capitalism. Um, so capitalism, very fucking, very fucking compatible with authoritarianism. Uh, leftism, you know, not as much. Um, although I guess you could point to like the Soviet Union or something, but like, I would argue that's not real leftism. But then of course, you get the 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 memes about like the no <laughs> communism's never been tried or whatever the fuck right but, uh, you know um which i i, I kind of get but um i don't know i feel like like we're at a point now where they're going to i don't know what the 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 ongoing relationship between the right wing and capitalism is going to be i guess i feel like like most things, they're gonna they're gonna selectively like and praise it when it serves their interest, and they're gonna selectively dislike and despise it when it doesn't. I mean, I've argued with conservatives where they say that they believe the world is being run by like, you know, the elites, and they're you know turning us against each other, and they're f turning us against our own interests. I'm like, yeah, that's why we need to tax the rich, and they're like, no, that's what they want. It's like, how's that what they want? That's not what they want. They want the opposite of that. So, yeah. Um, it falls apart pretty quick. A lot of their, their arguments when you push them. Uh, I mean, it's yeah. but, but they're not. The arguments are not meant to be solid. They're just meant to exist because really, it's an emotional ideology that's about the gratification of certain like deep seated impulses and bigotries that exist within them, and it's all like a very elaborate justification. Uh, you know, this they're not building an ideology from the ground up looking for like what works best what does the evidence say it's all emotionally i want to hate this group of people or whatever the fuck so how do i justify that um and you know i think that you know if, if they were really honest with themselves and stopped starting at the conclusion and working back then you know i think that the world would be a, a better place for sure yeah um i have maybe time for one more question uh, right on. Well, uh, yeah. So, I mean, you, you kind of answered the, the main thing that I wanted to get to, which is that you, you more or less pop. I don't think you like spawned the term SJW, but you definitely I did not. I did it. not coin the term. Okay. But I, um, I think I, I think I laid the foundation for what an anti SJW video was. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, because I, I remember that, I watched, uh, I watched that video that you talked about and then a couple of others and kept on down that that rabbit hole, I suppose, for a while until the point where I was like, wait, are they even talking about the same thing anymore? Like, this is just throwing that word around, not you, but some, some other skeptic YouTuber back in the day. Yeah, uh, well, uh, like many terms on the internet, you know, things become abused uh, to the point where they're unrecognizable from their original intention. <laughs> you know what yeah. I mean? Um, like, any term that you throw around to kind of identify a particular behavior, um, eventually becomes so, the, so saturated and people start misusing it. And before you know it, it just becomes a catch-all term for a person I don't like, and then it's useless. 
And uh, SJW became that. Um, Grifter has become that. Uh, you know, all every fucking logical fallacy that you yeah. know became popularized has become that. Things that are not straw man arguments are called straw man arguments. Things that are not slippery slopes are called slippery slopes. People who are not even remotely grifters are called grifters. People who are not even remotely SJWs are called SJWs. Um, and it's all just becomes like word soup, word salad, whatever, where, you know, it just becomes another term for like, yeah, I don't like you, you know? Just, yeah, just a rock to throw at your perceived enemy, right? So right. Uh, hey, you're bad. You're this thing that I don't like. I've slapped you with this label. You're defeated. So if, if in, in like just a, you know, a, a short soundbite kind of thing, is there anything that you would say to people who, who go around, you know, throwing SJW and that type of woke even around, like, is there anything you could say about your transition or, uh, from how you used to see it or, or how it, it was really and how it's become like that, you, that might pierce through to them? That well, sound bites are not exactly my specialty, but I will say this. Um, when you're pissed off at SJWs, or you're pissed off at wokeness. I feel like there's definitely instances where there are people who go way too far with that sort of ideology and there should be means and methods of criticizing those people, um, especially when they start to try to limit creative freedoms or try to limit freedom of expression. Um, but um, ultimately um, you have to be careful on, you know, you can't just look at every fucking person who wants social progress on any front as being part of the group of people that's trying to like censor your ideology or whatever the fuck. Um, what I would advocate for, what I want is a world where people who, whether they're left wing or right wing can have like conversations about topics and explore ideas in an open and honest way in something approaching good faith. Uh, sounds like a fucking fantasy, sounds like a pipe dream, probably is, but it would be a hell of a lot better than what we have now. And I would say that anybody who wants to cooperate to make that into a reality, uh, you know, and we, we, we've all done things that are absolutely counter to that, I'm sure. Yeah. But, uh, you know, it's a good aspirational thing to maybe keep in your fucking heads, a world where people can disagree and even vehemently and fucking, you know, maybe even like harbor some like deep seated resentments against each other, but can still explore those ideas in an honest fucking place. Uh, but, you know, I feel like, I feel like a lot of people I know on the left are like willing to do that. And a lot of people on the right that I know are not. Um, and like I said, I think it's because they're continuously working back from conclusions. So don't work back from conclusions. That'd be my fucking advice. Start erase all of your ideology and start from the ground up and like actually build it on evidence this time and see where you end up. Cause I don't think it's going to be right wing fucking, um, you know, whatever, yeah. anything. So, uh, Fair that'd man. be what I say. Super appreciate it, dude. That was awesome. My little tiny sound bite. Don't, <laughs> don't be bad thing. Be good yeah. thing. There you go. Think better. Think more good. Yep. All right, TJ, I really appreciate it, dude. Thanks for taking the Thanks. time. And uh, yeah, I'll uh, talk to you later on. Appreciate it. Bye-bye. Appreciate it.